Okay, so I think that's fine. So I'll start now. This is this talk is generally called Meltdown for Dummies, um, and the subtitle Road to Hell is full of good intentions. And I, as I said, I'm going to try and show, explain how this vulnerability came about, how it could be exploited, but also that you know there was no. It's sort of a natural consequence of, of our demands to rev up after the CPU power over the years. You know, we've asked for it, they, we've got it, but this was this is almost a natural consequence of of, of, of what's had to be done. So the road to help, uh, the, all this material is under Creative Commons, share and share alike, so um, you can reuse it subject to the normal um, the normal terms and conditions. So, I mean, I didn't know this, but the quote, the road to hell is full of good intentions, or something akin to that was coined in, I think, the 12th century by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. That's nothing to do with clairvoyance, I don't think. I thought it might be, but it's not. And what I'm going to show is that basically, you know, we have our computers, and through a bunch of good intentions, which I will point out as we go along, and then through this meltdown bug, uh, vulnerability, this meltdown exploit, we end up in, in hell. And so maybe we should listen to St. Bernard. Maybe he wouldn't have known about computers, but he predicted many things. So here we go. Here's the technical, semi-technical content. So the, I'm going to give an introduction. Most of the talk will be spent doing this analogy, where I will talk about um, this analogy of how of memory accesses and how that translates um, through to the computer version. And then I'll briefly talk about the anti-meltdown patches and do some performance implications based on some data which people have given me. But the major content of the talk is in this analogy and going through the various stages which which meltdown does and it sort of goes through not saying in, in time order but sort of various features of, of modern CPU development. So what is meltdown? This is from Wikipedia. Um, meltdown it exploits a race condition inherent in the design of modern CPUs. This occurs between memory access and privilege checking during instruction processing. Additionally combined with a cache side channel attack this vulnerability allows a process to bypass the normal privilege checks and isolate the ex exploit process from accessing data blogs, the operating system, and other running processes. The vulnerability is an unauthorized process to read data from any address. This is mapped to the current process's physical memory. So this is the classic, you know, aren't we clever? Look how complicated that is. Um, but, you know, hopefully by going through this analogy, I'll explain all these features and I'll point out at the end how these highlighted features and correspond to my analogy, or at least correspond to what, what's going on. The analogy I'm going to use, well, computers, this is one of my bugbears, computers are analogies. The fact we have keyboards is an analogy to, to typewriters, the cap, you know, our terminology about file stores and files and, and directories is based on physical filing cabinets. Even our desktop is a, you know, an analogy for a, you know, a messy desk with lots of, not windows here, but things scattered around it. So my, I, when I decided to write this talk, I thought, you know, surely there must be an analogy which um, which illustrates the meltdown bug. And the one I came up with was a lawyer's office. So in this analogy, the computer, which is the machine, is represented by this lawyer's office. The operating system is the lawyer. Um, I don't know if the operating system was the, or was the CPU. The operating system stroke CPU is the lawyer. I haven't quite sorted out what the best analogy there is. The memory system, which we'll see as sort of semi-autonomous, is represented by legal clerk. clerk. The RAM, the memory, are, are my filing cabinets. Our filing cabinets, the accessible data are my legal documents, which I've stored in the lawyer's office, which I want to access, and the secret data are other people's documents stored in the safe, which I'm not allowed access to. So this is my picture. Here's the lawyer's office. How can I trick them into giving me access to sensitive information? So uh, what the analogies here are the front office, which is where I'm allowed access to, it's where I go and ask to see my documents. There's the back office, which I can't see. There's some sort of wall between the two. So I have access to the front office, the back office is where the, the business stuff goes on, but I'm not currently have access to that, not directly at least. Um, me, I'm represented as a naive simpleton, which is not an unusual kind of analogy. Um, the lawyer, she's represented there, she's the person I speak to who makes the decisions. But importantly, in the back office, there are my files, which, is my, which are stored there. There's also secret files represented by these safes that I'm not supposed to see. And there's a legal clerk who does the, the, the dog's body work in the back office. So given that setup, how can I trick them to give, act, give me access to sensitive information? So the equip, computer equivalents which I've got here are, on the right-hand side, we've kind of got the software side. On the left-hand side, it's kind of more on the hardware side. I'm a user program. The lawyer, she's sort of the operating system or sort of the CPU. That's maybe not the best analogy. Um, 
the, my, the user memory of my documents, the things I'm allowed to read, the OS kernel memory, which is where all the secret stuff is stored in these safes. I'm not allowed to see that. And the, 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 the um, Clark, legal clock is the memory system. So I'm going to go through a few kind of examples of how things work to try and build up what's going on. So if I want to make a memory request, I say, can I see my document? So I turn up at the legal office. I know, can I see my document number one, please, which is stored you know, in, in filing cabinet number one. Now, important, there has to be some, some, um, some, some author authorization here. So the lawyer asks, can I see your ID? I'm going to skip over that for the moment. It'll turn out to be quite important later on. But I show some documentation. Here's my ID. And she says, OK. So because she's happy that I am authorized, she then asks, the office assistant, the clerk, the clerk to go and get the document. So she shouts on Igor. Igor goes away and, and gets my document from, from filing cabinet number, from, from document store number one. And this all takes quite a lot of time. I'm sitting here waiting around. We'll come back to that later on how to optimize this process. But Igor gets the file, comes back, and delivers a copy to me, and I'm happy. Okay? So that's how a legal request goes goes on. Basically, I, I, I asked for my document, which you might like to see. It's authorized. Then the lawyer asked the clerk to get the data. The clerk comes back, gives me the data. We're all happy. What happens for an illegal request? It's quite simple in this naive form. I say, can I see the contents of safe number zero, please? Can I see your ID? I hand over my ID. She checks the ID and says, no, you can't. OK, go away. And I'm apologetic. Sorry, I asked something I wasn't allowed to see. And that, that's that seems very clear, okay? There's not really problems here. There is one problem, there is one design decision that's been made here. Good intention one. So GI stands for good, good intention one, the office should operate quickly. Now, we could store the safes in a different office, a different back office, but that would mean that it would be really slow to go to a different office every time the clerk wanted to act as a secret doctor. The, the clerk is going to see everyone's doctor as secret documents, all kinds of stuff. They don't want to have to go to a different office every time they want to access the secret documents. So we store them all in the same office. We just deny access to the safes if people aren't authorized. But they are stored in the same office. And the equivalent on our computers, the, the way that modern operating systems are designed, I believe this is true of, of Linux and uh, most Unix flavors, Mac OS, slightly more complicated Windows, but I think it boils down to the same thing. All physical RAM is mapped into the virtual address space of all user programs. All the data is there, it's at least not visible, but it's there in front of you. But the operators have checked privileges of the accessing process, and only kernel, only, only privileged OS processes are allowed to access outside of user memory. So we've done that, and that's been a choice to make sure that the, the, the legal clerk can access anyone's documents and kernel documents quickly. They're all in the same back office. And We'll, so for the future, we'll assume that all access are valid. So we won't do the validity check for a while. The unintended consequence is that I can see where the secret documents are stored. So I can ask for them. I can see their safes there. I can ask for them. So if they're in a different office, I wouldn't even be allowed to ask for them. But, 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 but my access is denied. So there's not a problem there, we hope. So if I make a memory request, I come in and I say, can I see my document number one, please? The uh, Igor goes off gets document number one, comes back, gives me a copy, I read it, and then, thanks, Igor has to take the document, and then return it to the document store, and return, return to his position. Then I realized that actually, I, don't want, I, I read page one, I want to read page two, okay. So, um, can I get it again, please? So, Igor has to go off, same thing, get the document, come back, Show me the document, take the document back. And then I realized that actually I, I want to read page one again. So I say, OK, can I have it again, please? And off goes Igor, does the whole thing again. So by this point, Igor's getting pretty annoyed. He's having to run back to the board and get the same document all the time. And so, um, you know, that's really, he's not happy, OK? Igor's sitting there with a bit of a cloud over his head. He's not very happy with having to do. So this is clearly very inefficient. And, and in real computer programs, we do ask for the same memory over and over again. That's very classic. You may, you know, so, so, so this seems a crazy thing to do. So Igor has a bright idea. Okay? Igor spends a bit of pocket money and buys himself a table. And the table is crucially in the back office. So if what happens now 
is I come in and can I see my document number one, please? Igor does the same thing as before, goes to the document store, gets document number one, comes along and gives it to me. But crucially, on the way back now, he stops off and he deposits the document on the table. He thinks, well, if he's asked for this document, he might want it again, so I'll stick it there. Then he returns to his station. So if I ask for it again, again, please, this time, Igor can just pick the document off the desk, deliver it to me in the front office, and that is all very quick. And I noticed this document came back very quick. That was quick, thanks, Igor. And importantly, on the way back, he puts the document back in the, on the desk and returns to the position. So that the second transaction is much quicker. So by buying this desk and sticking documents, and there's space for more than one document over on the desk, then, then we can make access much more quick. Okay, so that, and the Igor's now happy. So that seems really good. Uh, so that, that, so, good intention too, memory access should be fast. Why keep going back to the document store all the time? Keep reaching documents close to hand, but they're still secure in the back office. And on the computer, well, the way it works is that memory system keeps copies of the recent data in fast cache memory. There is many levels, but there's cache memory, which is fast, faster to access. So recently accessed data will be close to hand in the cache memory. And reads and writes will apply to the cached copy, not the main memory. So you don't have to go back to the document store all the time. You don't have to go back to the main memory. This is done automatically in hardware. The user doesn't say, please give me cache line, please give me the document in the cache. The user still says, please give me memory location, blah, X. But if it is in the cache, then, then the memory system gets it from the cache. That's transparent, that's in the back office. But this does have an important unintended consequence. So this is a, I stress to see this is a fake situation, but on the bus home last night, I noticed my partner, I noticed my partner's car parked outside the lawyer's office. And when I got back, I said, oh, I saw you at the lawyer's office today. Oh yeah, I was checking the mortgage arrangements. So I rush off to the lawyer's office and I say, can I see our mortgage arrangement? And she says, yes, well, how are you going to fetch it for you? But it takes a long time to come back. So I know that my partner wasn't looking at the legal documents. If my partner had been looking at the mortgage arrangements, they would have been in the cash and then they'd come back quickly. What were they looking at? Oh, can I see our prenup agreement, please? And our legal effective. Oh, that was quick. So they weren't looking at the mortgage, right? They looked at our prenup agreement, which states what happens is should we break up? That's a bit worrying. So the unintended consequence is that you can get access to Accessing documents that you are allowed to read can give you access to information you are not supposed to have. I know that my partner was not looking at the mortgage documents. They were looking at our prenup agreement. So on a computer, the time taken to load data from memory tells you if it's cached. You can then deduce whether or not it's been recently been accessed. So that's an important point. That's, you know, that, that's a side effect of caching data and we'll see that we can exploit that later on. So now let's return to the authorization step. That authorization is actually not as simple as I made out in the first part of you. So what, what's actually going to happen, this is back to our situation, same situation before Igor's got his table, he's happy there. I say, can I see my document number one, please? And, and then, um, and uh, the lawyer says, can I see your ID? So I pass over my ID. Now, actually checking my authorization is quite a long step. And actually what she has to do is she has to make a phone call. So she has to phone up somebody on the phone, and that's going to take quite a while. But eventually, she's happy, and she says, Igor, get the document. He gets the document the document store, brings it over, and gives it to me, and then takes it back. And, of course, in this case, he caches it on the way back. So that's how that works. So, so, so checking the authorization took quite a long time there. So good intention number three, authorization should be fast. Why wait to tell Eagle to go for the document? Why not say, look, Eagle, get the document. While you're getting it, I'll check your authorization. But don't deliver the document until the authorization is confirmed. So we're still safe. We're not going to give the document out um, unless the authorization is passed. But, um, but we're going to do it at the same time. And this is what modern CPUs do. They execute instructions out of order. 
if you execute instruction one, you don't wait for instruction one to complete before issuing instruction number two. And that's an essential technique to keep modern CPUs busy. Modern CPUs have many, many have very deep pipelines, dozens of instructions. We have to keep the beast fed with instructions. So we just we just plow ahead doing stuff. But whenever there's a, if ever there's a caveat, a condition to be met, we will make sure that we don't deliver data to the user unless it's allowed. We need to we carry on working away, but only deliver data to the user program once all the checks are passed. If the checks aren't passed, we roll back the previous state. So what we're doing is we're optimizing for the state where everything is okay. We just keep plowing ahead, assuming everything's okay. But then if something goes wrong, we roll back. We don't really care if the unusual case takes more time. And the same is true. This is called um, the terminology slightly um, be used slightly ambiguously. This is called out of order execution. You may have heard speculative, speculative execution is executing beyond a branch. You say if x do y, if x takes some time to evaluate, you basically carry on past there, assuming it was true or false based on past experience. So if if x is true, is normally if there's an if condition which normally evaluates to true, you keep a little record of what's going on. You plow ahead as if it were true, just to keep going. So you optimize the normal case, and then if x is not true, you have to roll back. But normally x is true. At the end of a loop, do I equal one to a million? At the end, if I is less than a million, go to the start of a loop. Well, that's that's true. Nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine times out of a million. So you optimize for that case, and on the and you roll back on the unusual case. So this is called I'm calling it out of order execution, but similar speculative execution, which is out of order beyond a branch, is a similar technique. So let's see what happens here. Out of order for illegal e execution. I say, can I see my document number one, please? Can I see your ID? Hand over my ID. And now the lawyer, at the same time, checks my ID and asks for the data. So she checks, but she's also asked Igor for the data. And Igor comes back and waits. So he doesn't deliver the data to me, he waits. And this is actually, now, this is actually a much more accurate representation of how caching works. Previously, I showed Igor caching the data on the return trip. At, now, the reason that there's a slight disparity here is that Real caches keep copies of data. Here, I don't want to make copies of this document. So in my analogy, there's only one true document. There's never a copy of it. But this illustrates what happens, happens when ca in, for caches in reality. Whenever data is retrieved from the memory, it's placed in the cache. Okay, So this is a much more accurate. So anyway, Igor is placed in the cache. At this point, my, my, um, my authorization is valid. And she says, okay, okay, Igor, you can deliver that data to, and I get it, and then I read it, and on the way back, Igor caches it back, back where it was before. Okay, so that was a legal document access request. And the only issue there was that um, that, that, that Igor waited, after caching the copy, Igor waited to get the authorization. Igor knew there was a caveat on this access, that the authorization had been passed. The lawyer, when she, she got the court call back, said it was all okay for the auto level back. Okay, fine. What happens if I do an illegal access? So I say, can I see safe number zero? So at the same time, can I see your ID? I hand over my ID. Now the lawyer does the two things. She asks Igor to get the data from safe zero, and she checks more authorization simultaneously. So Igor goes to the safe, he picks up the document, and he caches it. Now, this is a red document. This means I'm not allowed to see it, okay? She gets the thing back. I'm not a privileged user. I wasn't allowed to do that. She says, no, roll back, okay? Don't deliver that data. Just roll back to where we were, and I say sorry. But if you see here, this has not been a complete rollback. The data, the secret data, is now cached, okay? I didn't get access to it, but it's cached. So the unintended consequence of caching is that these rollbacks are incomplete. The secret data is in the cache. But I still can't read it. If we go back here, if I said, can I see it again, basically, Igor would go stop at the desk. The lawyer would phone. She would say, look, you're not allowed to see it. And I would, so I, just because it's in the cache doesn't mean I still can't read it, OK? But it's there, OK? So I can't read it. So it's all OK? Well, this is, do I detect C? So this is where you start to see, wait a second. This is all starting to get a bit, yeah, OK. I wasn't allowed to read that, but there's a copy in the cache, OK? So the final piece of the jigsaw is indirection. 
Many, a lot of programs, scientific technical programs, have loops that look like this. You loop from i equals one to n. You, you don't, you access based on some lookup table. So you say, I've got some index, which is a lookup table of i. So I'm indirectly, I'm not looking up the value i, I'm looking up the lookup table of i, and I'm doing an offset into some index. And I do xi equals xi plus y index, okay? So because I'm adding to xi the value of y of some lookup of i, so it's indirected through this lookup table. So this is so common, CPUs have machine code instructions, and you can basically say in a single instruction, could you please do this? Don't load the data from location i, but load the data from the location stored in location i, okay? So this is such a common thing that it's been, it's been put into hardware to do. Okay, and this is the final piece of the puzzle. Okay. So what I do is I do something a bit bizarre. I go into the office and I say, can I see my document number the same as the contents of safe number zero, please? What I'm saying is go to safe number zero, see what data is stored there, and based on that, access my document with that number. Okay. So well, maybe a bit wrong what happens here. So basically. Can I see your ID? I hand over my ID. And at the same time, the lawyer issues this instruction to Igor and checks my authority. So she's on the phone, but Igor goes, he goes to safe zero and he looks at safe zero. This is the illegal data I'm not allowed to see. He sees it's got value number three in it, okay? So he says, what that means is I have to look, I have to then I go and get document number three because the value in the safe was, was three. So I have to get document number three. So he goes and he gets document number three. He cakes it, and then he comes and he waits because he doesn't know if he's allowed to do this. The authorization comes back and she says, roll back. Because that initial access to safe zero, which triggered the access to document three, was illegal. So I have to, so 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 the dog is not delivered to me. Okay. So this this was okay, that was fine, okay. Not much happened there, but the rollback was incomplete because there's a document cached in, in, on the table there. So let's maybe just replay that again. Can I see my document, which is number the same as content of safe number zero, please? I hand over my ID, which will turn out to be invalid. Igor goes off, looks at the safe, which he's allowed to do. The data, the data is three. He then goes and gets my document number three and wants to give it to me, but he stopped because the authorization, not for that access, but the preceding one, and these are all changed. You know, if something is illegal, everything after it is illegal. Rolls back, but we have this fingerprint that my document three is now in the cache. So what did we, we wanted to have a way of being allowed to read data we should not have access to. What we actually achieved was a way of not being allowed to read data we do have access to. I'm allowed to read documents. If I'd asked for document number three, it would come back. Because they asked for it via a roundabout way, I wasn't allowed to read it. Seems to be, so we've, we've manufactured the situation where I'm not allowed to read data which in principle I have access to. But there were side effects. I was not able to read the value three from the cat, from the safe. But my document three is in the cache, and I can detect that because what I do, the roll, the unintended consequence, the, the rollback is incomplete. There's a fingerprint in the cache, produces a side effect of accessing a secret document. I wasn't able to read the secret document, but I can now read my own documents and see how quickly they come back. So I go into the office and I say, "Can I receive my document number zero, please?" She says, "I'll have you go fetch it for you." Takes a long time. Okay. I have to troll through. Can I see my document number one, please? Off goes Igor. Takes a long time. This is getting a bit tedious. Can I see my document number two, please? Takes a long time. Can I see my document number three, please? Igor gets it. Bang, it's there. That was very quick. So because my document three came back quickly, I know that the secret value in the safe, which I wasn't supposed to be able to read, was three. Okay, bingo. So meltdown in a nutshell, you try to read an array element from one of your own arrays, which you're allowed to read, but you take the index from the value of secret data. The read will fail eventually, but it is partially completed, so the, the array element will be cached. 
you scan through your array element, you scan through array element by element, measure the time taken to read each element and see if it's cached. If reading element i is fast, then the secret value is i. You don't care, you don't care what value is in your document, but because reading it was fast, because reading document three was fast, you know the secret data you weren't allowed to see was three. And that's how Meltdown works. Simple. So that's that's basically how it works. So it's really quite straightforward and it basically relies on these, you know, these these components which have all been designed to make things quicker. There are things like caching, um, storing system and user memory in the same you know, office, uh, out of order execution, and I missed one, um, uh, and indirection. Indirection being instantiated in hardware. Um, so that's basically it, and I hope that, 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 um, that helped explain it. I'm gonna go on to some of the consequences now, but there's one, if you read the paper, I'll give the reference the paper. Um, that analogy let me read a single digit naught to nine from my safe, because I had 10 document holders, I could read a single digit. If I wanted to read a date, a, 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 an element between naught and 99, I can do two things. I could tell Igor to go and get, you know, get the document based, I could I still have 10 documents, okay? But say, if it was 19, I guess say get document one, then get document nine. Or I could have a hundred documents and just tell him to get document 19. And it's not clear which of these wins. It turns out the time to access the documents dominates the read. Getting Igor to read the document, get the document is quick. Me accessing them is the slow bit. So approach A is up to a maximum of 20 document accesses, a value of 10. Okay, because I have to scan through. Um, um, I have to, yeah, sorry. To, do, to, to, to get the two digits one by one, naught to nine and naught to nine, I have to scan through um, all the documents twice, potentially, up to 20 document accesses, an average of 10 before a hit. The second one is 100 document accesses, but only one read, an average of 50. So the second one, I have to scan through many more documents, okay? So, so Igor does one read, and I have to scan through lots of documents. First case, Igor does two reads, and I only have to scan through a few documents. It turns out, right, because the time to access my documents dominates, it's A is much quicker, okay? So A, it, 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 it's option A. You read large numbers bit by bit, um, piece by piece, turn out to be bit by bit. So you have to scan through many few, fewer um, locations in your array. So technicalities, if you go to the URL, there's a paper um, which you can see there, which is quite really quite easy, quite nice to read. You can look at it if you want. Um, they take the extreme case, they read a single bit at a time. So they basically just say, you know, they, they say, is it an or or a one? Is it an or or one? Is it an or or one? And they have to check two documents. In fact, you have to check one, whether to come back quick or slow. If it comes back quick, you know it was a one. If it comes back slow, you know it was a zero. So they actually read a bit, they go to the extreme case. They, they access element bit by bit. There's technicalities. The target array needs to be spaced out in large blocks. So you, you have to read not to index of I, but index of 4096 time I. This is to get around large cache blocks and memory prefetching and stuff like that. Throw it, doing legal access throws an exception, because you know you get some kind of exception, but you need to deal with that. You can instantiate an, um, um, an exception handler. Actually, what they do here is they're actually running, actually run on an Intel, a more modern chip, like an Intel chip, there's some concept of transactional memory. So you can basically do, I don't quite understand, but you can, you can do this transactional memory access, and if it fails, it doesn't trigger an exception. It just said you weren't allowed to do it. So I don't quite understand transactional memory, but that's quicker than, than, than throwing an exception and catching it. It's just a technicality. But given this, they can read data on up to half, 500 megabytes, um, sorry, 0.5, yeah, 0.5 megabytes per second, one bit at a time. Okay, so that, that's, that's, I'm surprised, you know, if, if you tell me you're having to read data one bit at a time and do all this stuff, but they can read it at half a megabyte a second with an error rate of 0.02%. So one in um, two in a, what's that? Um, two in a, two in a 10,000 error. So that's, you know, that's pretty impressive. So, um, with it, what is meltdown? Meltdown is a race condition, and this is a race condition of what you authorize and access simultaneously. 
So you know, the, you, and, 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 and the access typically finishes before the authorization is, before the rollback happens. So that's the race condition. Design of modern CPUs, well, that's out of order execution. That's the key thing. Uh, memory access is, is done by the hardware, but privilege checking is done by the operating system. So there's a separation of concerns, and it's that conflict which causes the issue. This weird phase cache side channel attack is just how long does it take to read data from a user array. But the key one is it allows you to read data from any address that's mapped to the current process's memory space. And the way the operating system works, that turns out to be all RAM. Be because your because the operating, because the kernel memory is stored in the same as I had an office, as the um, as as your data, um, the entire RAM of of the computer is mapped into your virtual address space. You can see it, or you can ask for it. You you, you refuse access to it, but it's all there before you. So that 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 is the key sort of you know exploit. But that that's that that's important to note. So the mitigation is that you give up on this good intention one, well, the office should operate quickly. You don't store your data in the same office, okay? If Yvonne needs to get, wants to, wants to access the safes, he has to go to a different office. I can't even see the safes, so I can't even, I, it's not, the analogy breaks down here, but I can't even say, could I see the data in safe zero, because it's a different office. So you, you completely separate kernel memory from user memory. So you keep the program memory, the net system memory separate, that means the OS has to actively switch between user and kernel memory. So Igor has to go to a different office to get this. And that introduces additional context switching. So that's, that's the price you pay for introducing these anti-meltdown patches, is there's more switching between user and, and, and kernel memory. This can make, this, this, this can make making, making operating system calls more slow. Often, on your behalf, the operating system has to access um, Protected memory. So if I do I/O, it's the classic one. I want to write data to disk. That data is written by the operating system into special protected memory to go off to the device, and 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 has to do that. Now I'll have to switch between the two. Every time it wants to take my data out to disk or out to um, uh, um, uh, um, some me message passing um, level, going out through some some interconnect, some some um, some some network connection, it's going to have to switch between the two memory spaces. So it could have to, so it could adversely impact I/O performance because that's a classic case where you make lots of operating system calls which have to do this switch. So so I'm, I'm going to go quite quickly through the actual um, the actual data. Um, this data was actually was provided it was taken on a Skylake system which is a very modern Intel processor at Cambridge, uh, but the analysis was done by my colleague by Andy Turner. And so I've given you the URL there. Andy's put this stuff up on the web. But basically, the, there are no significant performance differences apart from this. This is the quote from Andy. Apart from the synthetic test of parallel write performance, bench IO, which is a, a benchmark we developed for doing IO, where we see a 10 to 50% performance drop. The problem with IO is that IO is notoriously non reproducible. So, in fact, these, these are all very recent results. So that this 10, 15 percent variation is what you'd expect from a parallel file system during normal operation. So it may not be associated with the patching process. There is also some latency message passing latency measurements from um, a standard benchmark called Be Effective. Here it shows some odd features that require further investigation. But the major point here is the top. There really are. We have seen no significant performance differences. Um, so, for example, this is. Um, a cast step program run on a standard test case, an aluminum three by three slab, and the unpatched is the solid line, and the patched is the um, is the uh, dotted line. And you can see there are some differences, but there, you know, this is this high is good here, but there's not a big difference here. Um, cast step, I think, does a lot of all to all communication, but really, not a big difference there. Another application, Gromax. Um, again, you can hardly see. Again, the unpatched is slightly faster than the patched at the top here, but that's on a thousand CPU cores. That's kind of within the noise. Um, this is the parallel I/O luster. The patched is slower here by, as Andy noted, 10 to 15 percent. That would require more. Um, that would require more um, testing. You might say, well, it's consistently lower. 
But this benchmark could be run at one in the afternoon, this could be run at three in the afternoon, and so on. The other user was hammering the file system. Parallel file systems are shared. Um, so again, Andy's pointing out, sorry, Andy's quote, only a few data points for cast have been run the difference could be due to different conditions at runtime within normal expected variation. So, you know, again, you share the interconnect at some level on the parallel machine. So, so, so you know, the, the, the one where you do do a lot of sharing of parallel file systems, they tend to get overmoded. But as Andy's pointing out here, you know, the, even the variations for cast up and grow out could be explicable by just general system, system conditions, system noise. Um, Random ring latency, um, this is the, the patched, shows higher latency, but the scale here is quite expanded. These results are quite suspiciously quantized. So again, you know, that's 1.5 to, I mean, that's not a huge difference here. Um, I find it slightly different, difficult to read. I think you're, you're, hopefully you're seeing slightly more. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. I mean, nothing really, again, it's an expanded scale on the left there. Minimum ping pong bandwidth, again, this, this is the test which kind of saturates, doing lots of ping pong. In fact, the patched here, the minimum was higher, which is good. So again, again, these are suspiciously quantized, thing, but you know, again, not a big deal, nothing to write home about. Archer, so, so I say TDS, Archer does not, I believe, currently have the meltdown patches installed. We have a test and development system where it does have the patches installed. Um, Andy, so again, Andy's making, so Andy's synthetic benchmark performance here isn't, um, so, so the synthetic benchmarks, ping pong, latency, all sort of show differences, but when you run a real application, which is really what you care about, you often don't see those things. The synthetic benchmarks are very, very specific and they can be very affected by small subtle differences. But here we have, you know, basically there's nothing to write home about. So, so our test and development system, it's a smaller system than Archer, um, but we see nothing for Castep. And in fact, the patched results here for Gromax are faster. But, you know, maybe that's noise, maybe that's other stuff changed as well. So again, um, performance, um, um, okay, so Andy's pointing out here to his comment, variations for his results is less, uh, the results of the TDS can be taken as more reproducible because the test and development system is only used by a few people at a time. So it's kind of an isolated system. Um, so Adrian, a colleague Adrian here is saying, um, I'll have to bring up a comment here. Adrian has seen um, between a 2 and 50% impact depends on, on thread. Okay, so the high performance um, conjugate gradient benchmark um, does use threading, and other people have reported this, that for threading, um, the meltdown patches seem to have more effect. Um, so it's not entirely clear to me why that is. I've seen that reported elsewhere. But again, our, our agents here is saying uh, things between 2 and 5 percent. And yes, so Unix with modern internet such as I, Infinity Band does IO bypassing the kernel. So we haven't looked into detail of that, but yes, modern, modern HPC systems recognize that operating systems calls are slow, so they try and bypass them. They do all they can, there's lots of setup at the start. So basically, you know, you do as few operating system calls as possible. So there is a paper out there which shows quite significant um, performance impacts from meltdown, but it's a very old system, I think running old software where possibly, you know, it just wasn't, configured very well, I, I don't know. So no, we, we have looked at nothing in, in particular detail, but, um, you know, basically there's not a big story here that we, really, so summary, at its core meltdown is remarkably simple. Um, it's completely analogous to this everyday office situation, but the way I set up in this office, you, you it just, you know, you go to your lawyer's office, it is possible to hoodwink the lawyer and her assistant to give you information that you should not get access to. This, there's nothing, you know, like all things I believe in computing, you know, there's nothing new. They're written and designed by people, you know, they're analogies. Here's an analogy which shows it. So for many years, CPU and OS design has focused on speed, as we all know, speed kills. Um, performance, um, ah, now I'm missing, sorry, so I, I skipped a slide there. Performance, 
little or no impact seen so far. Um, well, so Anton, so come back to this. So can I just finish this slide? Little no impact seen so far. What effect would a normal OS update have? So, if, you know, if, if every time there was an OS update, you went away and did all these tests, I bet you have seen it, loads of updates that had a plus minus 10% impact over the past. IO may suffer. This bench IO, which I actually wrote, so I know a bit about it, is optimized to do a small number of OS write calls. It's very, it's a, it's a, it's a wind behind you, you know, going down the hill thing. Real applications are not so simple as this bench IO, as Andy has said before, real applications are much more complicated. You know, I think that I think that applications that don't do their I/O particularly efficiently, if you get away with it now, you may not get away with it now. Bound patches. I don't know. That needs further investigation. The bottom line is, though, are there really any for, for a shared system? Any user being able to read all the RAM is a big issue. But remember, the compute nodes on Archer are, are single user. There's only only one person running them at once. So, on a single user system, are there really any security implications? On Archer Compute, you know, the OS is unlike to have any, any envelope relevant to other users. When I can read data that the OS stores on me, well, you know, I provide it. So, I mean, uh, you know, we, I, 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 I don't want to speak for the systems team, but, you know, I don't know if we're planning to, to install these patches on the, on the compute nodes. You'd obviously probably want to install them on the, on the login nodes, but the user. Um, so, um, I'd like to acknowledge, I chatted a lot to people like Stephen Booth, Rupert Nash, Nick Johnson, Ali Hume about these things, which gave me the analogy. Andy Cheddar and Adrian have done a lot of benchmarking. So there's a bit of conversation going. So basically, um, somebody asked, uh, Anton asked, if it's so simple, why was it discovered ages ago? Well, it does require out of order execution. So um, that has been around for, what are we talking about? Maybe since 2010, is that when it came in? So that's sort of um, um, round about then. Um, there's a very interesting paper from about six months to a year ago from a guy who basically spotted all this, run tests on his machine but couldn't see anything. And he said, look, this should all in principle work, but it is a race condition. Maybe previously the authorization was maybe, maybe the you know, maybe the authorization came through quicker. I, I don't know. Um, without transactional memory, which is a lot, very, very recent, you had to you had to catch the exception in um, the same process as the parent, because the exception is going to kill. So, so you spawn a sub process or a thread to the illegal stuff. That causes an exception. You catch that in the in the parent thread and process it there. Maybe that makes it harder to do, I don't know. But in fact, you know, well, maybe it was discovered a long time ago. It's only become publicly known recently. Who knows that it hasn't been being used by, you know, people for, for a long time. I mean, um, um, so, um, so somebody is mentioning Spectre here. Um, so I have, I have mentioned Spectre here. Um, Spectre is like, Spectre is more complicated, and so so the normal my bug the, the normal security vulnerability says you know there's this problem, a specially crafted program executed in this way might allow a user to possibly do this, which could do that, which might bloody bloody blah, blah, blah right. 50, so Spectre requires on exploiting I understand particular features of particular programs, so you can you can guard against Spectre by by um, um, you can guard against Spectre by patching software, saying, look, I've got software here which does access, which accesses privileged data, so I'll make sure that I do it safely, okay? The important part about Meltdown is that it doesn't require that, it's just, you can run it an arbitrary program. Does Meltdown look for data placed in the cache by speculation for data evicted from the other phone? So Meltdown looks for data, um, well, the, okay, so, so Meltdown looks for data placed in the cache by speculation, but what it does is it, 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 um, it does a flush and a read. Uh, no, it not, no, it looks for data, data placed in the cache by speculation, um, um, not evicted. Um, so you, you basically, um, yeah, you, you look for, you know, was data, what, 
if location three is cached, then it means that the secret document contains the value three. So you look for date, as I understand it, um, you go back to um, you go back to to, to um, um, yeah, you're looking for whether a certain data element was cached. So I don't know at what. So, so someone said here, meltdown has been demonstrated on CPUs from 2011. So it's been around for five or so long, six or seven years. Um, maybe it, it was, but it's been in principle around. Um, so for um, for a long time. Um, so, um, but um, why it suddenly come about? Um, I mean, yeah, um, why it suddenly come about now is um, um, another point which colleague Nick Johnson made to me is, again, I'm not a hardware designer, but there is surprisingly little support in hardware for, for, for multi-user systems. That There is a separation of concerns, you know, software and hardware. The hardware model is very much, you know, program accesses data. You know, the, the multiple process stuff is done at the OS side, so it's up to the OS to check, you know, if data access is illegal. So, you know, with more support in hardware. Um, um, okay, so uh, Adrian's, okay, so, so yes, if you look at the paper, they give, they give, you know, timings for, you know, how quick was it to read it from cache, how quick was it to read it from memory. And even there, the difference isn't huge. And so as Adrian points out yet, the, if cache and memory speed are much very similar, then it's going to be much harder to see. It's only because because memory is crippling. Well, on the grand scheme of things, memory is, is getting slower and slower compared to clock speeds. The cache memory is faster and faster, and so maybe that differential makes it easier to see. Um, uh, that may be um, that might be the reason. I don't know. As I said, um, so. Hopefully you found that useful. Um, the I'll just share the. So this is the paper. Um, which is from uh, meltdownattack.com. Um, I, I read it and didn't really understand it, and then I spoke to a few people and and they pointed me in the right direction. Then I read it again and it, it I understood it was quite. So this is the night. This is the graph here of uh, the access time um, uh, across different pages. This is the statement that you, that you, you spread out your array in multiples of 4096. So, so differences of one in your source data corresponds to differences of 4096 bytes in your target array, which means you go to a different page. But you can see that it was 400 versus, this is quite a clear signal, but it's 400 versus, but this expands 400 versus 250. So it's still, it's not, you know, it's there, but it's not blinding the obvious, possibly. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think this is relatively. This is used as they don't use analogies here, but they, but they do have some nice diagrams and stuff. So hopefully, you that should now. Um, but I think the main um, um, point to get from this talk is, as somebody pointed out in the comments, that HPC system, you know, HPC system designers were known for ages that making OS calls can be slow. So, so there's lots of techniques in system software uh, to, to, to make sure that they're called as as, lit, as as infrequently as possible. And a corollary of that is that this meltdown um, uh, patches, which potentially, which do increase the overhead of making system calls, have a relatively small impact. You can come up with synthetic benchmarks which show large implications in 30, 50% overheads, but HPC, typical HPC applications don't actually, don't actually demonstrate that. So I don't think there's really that much to worry about. Um, but I, as I said before, why I think it's interesting is that if you to understand the uh, the way that the meltdown vulnerability operates, uh, takes you through the history of CPU design and, and goes through these key elements, especially the variety of order execution, caching, and and this sort of indirection, coupled with with the way that operating systems try and get all the memory in one place, just leads inevitably to this being a being a security um, issue. Um, so if there's no more questions, um, we're almost up to the hour. Um, I hope everyone found that useful. Um, and as I said, this will be going up on the, the web as a, um, 
has a, a video um, shortly. And um, I'll just to make the, I will end on a slide just to. Uh, thanks, everyone. Okay, goodbye.